Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming here and attending the Safeguard webinar today. Give me just one moment while I make sure everybody can hear me and all the questions are up. Okay, great. This is a live event, so I will be speaking to you live. You can ask me questions. If you have questions, please type them in and hit the enter button, and I'll be able to answer them for everyone. If you have personal questions, please save them to the end so that you're not sharing them in this public arena. All right, so what I want to do today is I want to share with you why it's important to protect yourself, what's, what's actually going on out there. Some of you might say what we're up against these days. Um, so I want to tell you why it's important to protect yourself. Uh, if you agree and you decide that it is important to protect yourself, well, you really only have two options. It's either a will or it's a living trust. So I'm going to go over wills and trusts as well. I'll compare them for you. I'll give you what I like to call the Reader's Digest version. So I will make this so easy and so very simple to understand that you will remember the information. It'll be very easy for you to remember. Um, and you'll be able to use anyone you like uh, as far as protecting yourself. Don't get me wrong. I would love to earn your business, but nobody here will pressure you. There's no cost for this, and there's no obligation to do anything. If you're interested at all and you want to work with us, I'm going to give you what I believe is a tremendous promotion. At the end of this, I'll offer it to you, and if you'd like to take advantage of it, I'll give you this little web address that you can type into your browser and, and send me your name and number, and I'll call everybody. I'll even make sure everyone has my cell phone. I'll, I'll even use my cell phone if you like. So you all have my personal cell phone. You never cost money to talk to me. I'll even help you if you wanted to work with someone else. I'll make sure it's right if you want to talk to me. But I would love to earn your business. Anyone that decides to work with us, if you want to, at the end, when you give me your name and number, I'm going to answer all your questions. If you want to do this with us, just let me know. I'll go ahead and get you started. It wouldn't be any money at all to get you started. Anyone that's interested in working with us today won't cost you anything at all to get started. No money whatsoever. So let's jump right in. I'm going to go over something called probate because that's one of the problems and protecting yourself while you're alive, and then I'll wrap it up for you. So my name here is Robert Levin. Everybody calls me Bobby. Um, you can call me anything you like, right? Again, what I want to do is share with you why it's important to protect yourself and go over everything I just mentioned. The name of the company is Safeguard Estate and Financial. If you Google Safeguard Estate, you'll see a picture of our building pop up and you can read all our reviews and check us out. There's over 70 years of combined experience in the office creating individualized or customized estate plans um, for... Uh, for individuals here in Arizona. There's over 20,000 uh, individual uh, customers that we have here as far as state funds. Yes, uh, I'm sorry. So Sabina, that's right, you can't see me. The, you're, we have a PowerPoint here so you can see what I'm presenting, not my face, I'm sorry. This is not a Zoom meeting. But I hope you can hear me. Okay, so again, there's over 70 years combined experience. There's the main office you'll see, and when you Google us, you'll see that picture. We have a new office now, four miles from there. We have one office in Scottsdale, one office in Oro Valley and another office in Tucson. This is where I tell you I'm not the attorney. I can't give legal advice or, or legal opinions on specific facts. What I'm allowed to share with you is what our attorneys told us, uh, what I know the law to be, and my experience. I've been here now just almost eight years. I've worked directly with this attorney the whole time. I grew up my whole life in California. In the last 18 years there, I met directly with judges and attorneys in their courtrooms, in their offices. And so there's a very, very good chance I can answer your question. So please don't hesitate to ask. Um, and I can do it without providing legal advice, most likely. Okay, so this is our attorney. His name is Mark Hall, M-A-R-K, last name Hall. He's a great attorney. Anyone that works with us, um, you have an attorney-client relationship with Mark and Safeguard handles the customer service. Mark has an associate named Cameron and another one named Peter. They're in Scottsdale. Mark personally is in Scottsdale, and he drives up to the Oro Valley and Tucson office personally. So it's a one-on-one -on -one with our attorney. The reason I call him a great attorney is because he's forthright, just like I'm going to be today. He'll share all the information with you. He doesn't, most attorneys keep everything close to the vest, and they only share just enough with you, so you have to use our service. Mark's a genuine, kind human being, and he'll tell you anything you want to know. He's a great attorney. But again, anyone that works with us, even if you're working with Peter or Cameron, Mark would be your attorney of record. So you have attorney-client relationship with Mark and a customer relationship with Safeguard. All right, I don't see any questions about that. I'm continue. There's three groups of people that come to these workshops. The first group, of course, you're not protected. You don't have anything in place at all. It's just like we're born in this world. 
no will and no trust. So of course, the second group, you might have a will, and the third group, you might have a trust. Okay, a little bit about wills and trusts right now. Wills are state specific. A trust will work everywhere the United States has authority. So all 50 states, including Guam and Puerto Rico. So if you move from Arizona and you take this trust and you go to Arkansas or, or Missouri or anywhere else, it'll work just fine. It'll protect you. If you have a will from Arizona and you go somewhere else, it, it won't do a darn thing. If it works at all, it will only work here. If you moved here from Minnesota with a will or anywhere else and brought a will with you, it won't help you. If it works at all, it will only work in the state where it was created, whereas a trust is federal. Now, we give you what's called a complete estate plan. So you have a trust and you have wills inside the trust and you have powers of attorney and HIPAA and everything, living wills, all that. The will inside of a trust, the last will and testament is designated as something different, has a different purpose. So it's no longer state specific, doesn't matter where it was made. All right, I hope you understand that. If not, I'm gonna clear it up in just a second. So let's talk about probate. It's not quite as bad as this picture where a judge is pointing a gun at you, but probate is a lawsuit with a state. It doesn't matter what state you're in, if there's probate, it's a lawsuit with that state and the state is running it. So you understand it might be time consuming, expensive, it could be frustrating. See, if you were here, it wouldn't happen. It's only because you're not here that probate is happening. Probate's job is ownership. And if you're not here and they start, they get to decide who owns everything that you owned when you were alive. That's the job. All right, I'm gonna read from the bottom here, what is probate? Probate is a judicial process where a will is proved in a court of law and accepted as a valid public document that is the true last testament of the deceased. Okay, it's the first line there, it's your first indicator actually, that wills are vulnerable. See, the difference between a will and a trust, a will has to get proved, which means it's supposed to go through probate. They don't all go through, it's not a mandatory probate here in Arizona, but most of them still do, and I'll address that. If, if you live in Florida or any one of these other states, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, New York, Wisconsin, those are mandatory probate states. In other words, if you have a will and you pass away in that state with a will, probate is mandatory. If you have a trust, well, you've avoided probate. That's, that's the basic thing about it. Okay. And the reason I'm bringing this up is not, I am honestly not picking on wills. Um, they have a great purpose. Um, but here's the thing. I have so many of my customers, I find out that they've gone to attorneys and the attorneys are not telling them what I'm about to tell you is actually possible if you have a will. They're letting them believe that they've avoided all of the headaches. And that's why I go over this like this, because if there's a will in place, you haven't avoided anything. You might, but we don't know. There's no way to tell until the time comes. Only a trust has avoided it ahead of time. And I'll go over this as we go. All right, so this chart here, it's just an example of how probate works so I could explain it. I decided that there was an estate worth $500,000. And so that's what this is, one estate worth $500,000. The way the judge would figure it out, they would send someone to the house, an assessor, to figure out what it's worth. They would send people into the house, two, three, four people or more, to catalog everything you have, T-shirts, jewelry, silverware, because they need a value. They're gonna find your money in all your accounts, IRAs, bank accounts, wherever it is, do a forensic accounting on everything and come up with a value. So in this case, I just said it was all worth $500,000. That's all preliminary work. The judge has to wait for that to get done before they can do anything. Once they have all that information, now they can get to work. They have to determine whether or not you owe any taxes, whether or not you have any debts, whether or not you have any children, of course, and if you do have children, uh, whether or not you wanted to give them anything, and so on. It's now the judge's job to do that. Um, and so it takes some time, it costs some money. One of the first problems we have with probate is how long does it take? The average time in probate is one to three years. Of course, the next problem is what it costs. The average cost is between six and 22% of your estate. So I went with 10% because it's conservative and likely that it would be at least 10%. Well, 10% of $500,000 is $50,000. That's court costs. Now we have to add the attorney's fees. They usually make at least what the court makes. So another $50,000 puts us at $100,000. That's quite of a haircut on a $500,000 estate. 20% of the estate just walked out the door. 
And so this is why I go over this because I can't imagine, I mean, it's only fair. I would be very upset if I was trying to protect my family and nobody gave me this information. A couple of other things that uh, go on with probate is, what if you have a special needs child or a companion or somebody living in that house? They're gonna be removed. They don't own the house, they don't get to stay there. The judge is not concerned with where they go either, just that they're not interfering with his issue. And then another thing he has is, his job is probate, his job is not maintaining the estate. So there's a way better than 90% chance that the judge is not gonna pay off any mortgage either, not gonna even make the payments. So it's very important that your family should step up and check with the judge uh, because the judge probably not paying that house payment. And if they don't step up and do it, the bank will come get the house during the probate process. And those are some of the things we're actually dealing with with probate. All right, so I don't see any questions. Let's keep going. Um, this is right off the Maricopa County Superior Court website. All of the counties are the same. The reason I go with Maricopa County is because everybody I talk to recognizes that county. But if you wanna to go to Coconino, Cocosino, Aguila County, Pima, Pinal, they're all the same. They're very crowded because most of us were not born in Arizona. We come here, we like it, we stay. So the courts are crowded when we pass away. I'm gonna read on the left-hand side there. At any given time, there are more than 20,000 active or pending probate cases in just this one county alone. And they're adding more than 500 every month. So what does that mean? That means, let's say somebody files a claim on your state. You pass away, somebody makes a claim. Like two months go by, they make a claim. Okay, now it might be six or eight months before they, your family even gets a, a hearing date to walk in the door and start the process. Then it might be a couple of more years to get it done. Okay, so you all know your family better than I do. You can, you, I'm sure you understand whether or not they're gonna do well with the kind of delays and the frustration of waiting and anticipation and anxiety that this brings. Okay, um, now, when you pass away with or without a will, everything about you is public information. If you're in probate, well then of course it's easily accessed in the courthouse, but it's all in the public records, either way. So when you pass away with a trust, everything about you remains private. The only thing they know is you passed away. With a will, they know everything. In fact, if you're in states in probate, anybody can come look, it's, it's free. The information that's in there is, tells them, have you ever been arrested? You ever, ever had any mental issues? Um, you ever had any medical issues? Every darn thing you own. Your children's names, addresses, and phone numbers are all there, so we're vulnerable. Imagine someone wants to see a probate case. Who would you like to see? Oh, how about my neighbor? So you understand. All right, now the judge, if your state's in probate, they're gonna pick someone, call them an executor. If you had a will and your state's in probate, they might end up with the same person, they might not. Their only concern is to find someone that will work well with them. The first thing they're gonna tell this person is to reach into their own piggy bank to pay for advertising in three different newspapers. And all three of these newspapers have to run an ad for six months. And they're gonna tell the whole world that you've passed away and if anyone wants to make a claim, come on and do it. I'm sure we've all heard that, right? People pass away, people come out of the woodwork. Yes, they do. But this is actually necessary. It doesn't matter if probate goes on for a year or five or 10 years, which it does often. But when it's over, if someone shows up and tells the judge they were supposed to get something, the judge says, where were you? I did my job, I even ran ads in the paper. So it's actually necessary. Excuse me. All right, so let's show you how it gets started. And then I'll go right into wills and trusts for you. So here I have an example. It's a husband and wife. If it's just you, it's just you. If it's you and your partner or you and your 10 best friends or brothers and sisters, that's who it is. This husband and wife, they own everything. They own the cars, the money, the homes. It's all theirs. This will give you an idea of how probate gets away with what they do. Ownership and title are the same thing. What I mean is, if you have a home, well, you have a deed for that house. They keep it at the county recorder's office uh, and they put your names on it because you're the owner and they call that deed title. If you have a car, well, there's a pink slip. It doesn't matter if you have the pink slip or the bank has the pink slip because your name is on it, you're the owner and they call it title. Same with the money in the bank, it works very similar. <clears throat> 
So imagine one spouse passes away. I'm sorry, guys. I <laughs> never take out the ladies first. Okay, so the husband's passed away. The, the wife is still here. Uh, this is Arizona. It's community property state. She's almost always fine. There would need to be a problem on the deed for her to have an issue. Otherwise, it's just work. The deed usually says and or with rights of survivorship almost always. And so in this case, we're going to say it's fine and she has work to do, right? When someone passes away, it's work. Sometimes it's months or longer, but that's all it is, is work. She's okay otherwise. So she lives for years. Then one day, she passes away as well. So they've both passed away now. If they both passed away, then the question is, who owns everything now? The answer is nobody. Because they just took title to the grave with them. So there's no living owners on title. That's how probate starts. No owners. And that's it in a nutshell. They lose ownership. All right, so I don't see any questions. I'll clear it up a little bit more. Let's go ahead and talk about wills. <clears throat> and then I'll talk about trust and compare them. And I'll talk about protecting yourself while you're alive because that's very important. All right, so wills. Here in Arizona, approximately 70% of all the wills in Arizona actually go through probate. The true number is 68.9%. <laughs> very close, 70%. Okay. I'll try and make this easy to understand. So that example I gave you of husband and wife a second ago, let's call them parents. And let's say they passed away and they've got some children. So their children take their death certificate in one hand and the wills in the other. And they go to the bank. They have to do something with the money. They go to the motor vehicle apartment to do something with the cars. And they go to escrow because they want to do something with the property. The problem comes in because they're asking these institutions for permission. They go in there and say, please let me do this. And the institutions look at them and they say, we can't because you don't own it. They're absolutely right. They don't own that house. Nobody's going to let them sell that house and so on. So what they tell them to do, go get the will probated is what they say. Because when they get this will probated, then the judge will prove it is what he's doing, proving it. And then applying court orders behind it that these institutions can now act on without getting in trouble because the judge has ordered them to do it. With a trust, it's 100% different. Whoever you choose goes over to those institutions and tells them to do this, and the institutions say, okay, because they don't have any choice, because we never lose ownership. All right, I'll address that in a moment. I have a couple of slides here to go over before I get off the wills, and then I'll go right into trust. These slides are not just about wills. They're wills and trusts. It's so important for you to be honest with yourself about who you're working with and who you're not working with, family or otherwise. And so these slides are here to help me explain what I mean by that. All right, the first one, wills can be contested. Yes, they can. Okay, so with a will, it means anybody can come make a claim. A will does not remove anyone's standing in court. A trust removes everyone's standing in court. What that means, if you were to pass away and someone wanted to make a claim on your estate, it could be your brother or your sister or your son or your daughter. It could be your spouse. It could be a stranger flying in here from another country. Every one of them is making a valid claim. If you have a will, they've made a claim and it's valid. And then the judge will adjudicate it later and decide whether or not it's going to be valid. With a trust, even your spouse or anyone else coming to make a claim would be making an invalid claim. That's, of course, if you had your own trust and didn't want your wife to be able to make a claim or your husband. If you want them to, well, if they don't need to. They've already got access to everything. So it keeps it very simple. But generally speaking, whoever you don't want in your life with a trust is not going to get in it. That's the difference. Let me give you an example. I'm going to come up with a hypothetical. Oh, no, let me give you a real-life example. A lot of my customers are my friends. I've done this a long time. One of my customers, um, his brother's two years older than him, and his sister's eight years younger. Him and his brother, they, they got old enough to go to school, college, and they had to actually work their way through school and pay. They did. They worked hard. They paid. They got good grades. Years later, they got married, had kids, bought houses, the whole thing. Their sister, on the other hand, she didn't have to pay for college because the parents saw what was going on, and they were able to save a little money. They had eight years to do it, so, so they did, um, and she didn't have to work her way through school, and years later, she got married, and even they bought a house. She, they threw a little money towards the down payment, which was fine. They're all happy about that. Then the parents went out and got wills, and they put the boys in there at 40% each, and their daughter was in there at 20%. So the problem came years later. 
because they passed away. And she looked at that and said, it's not fair. <laughs> Just like that. Her memory got very short. Losing parents is one of the hardest things that's ever going to happen in your children's lives. It just is. And it's easier to argue with someone over something that doesn't matter or something that does matter than it is to experience that loss. So when she looked at it, her husband was in her ear. That's not fair. She's right. She doesn't want to hear about uh, you paid for school years ago. And that, that's the issue. It wasn't fair. She was able to start a probate because it was a will. She couldn't do that with a trust. All right. The next slide here, blended families. Brady Bunch is the perfect one. I cannot figure out how they could solve the world's worst fight in five minutes, but I can help you with resolution of the family. So imagine they both passed away. Do you know this family gets on great? They love each other. That's why they're the perfect example because this happens so often. I've seen it so much. Do you know that when the parents pass away, it doesn't take all of these kids to get upset. It only takes one, just one. If one of them gets upset about something, it doesn't have to be something we think is important. Maybe it's over a trinket. Like maybe one of the other kids has something they don't want them to have. That's the worst one. But if one of them gets upset, you know what the others do, right? They take sides. You now have three on three, and you're not coming back to fix the family. And the reason this happens is because you're not here. If the parents were here, the kids wouldn't divide. There'd be no reason for it. Mom and dad are here protecting us and taking care of us. But once the uh, parents pass away, well, now they're going to protect their own. They're in a very vulnerable position with their, their loss and their mourning, and they're not going to stand for anyone attacking their brothers or sisters. And I hope these are helping. It's really, really important how you could deal with this ahead of time and resolve it before it ever happens. All right. Okay, brothers and sisters, they, they grew up arguing with each other anyways, right? And this is over whatever. This is perfect example. The one I brought up earlier. That young lady had standing in court because it was a will. If it was a trust, she wouldn't have standing, wouldn't be able to do it. Here's the difference. One of the ongoing services that Safeguard does, this is the last one we're going to provide you, but we're going to settle the estate for you. Again, whoever you choose, if it's a will, it's an executor. If it's a trust, it's a successor trustee. Same position, just with authority. Whoever it is, you'll choose. They'll call us, and figuratively speaking, we'll hold their hand, and we'll walk them through the whole thing. Now. There's no fee for that. We're very fast. But in this case, if she has a trust, the parents have a trust, and the daughter, as I mentioned earlier, comes up and says what she says, we say, listen, your parents love you very much. And they thought they'd set this up the way they thought was fair. She could would still go start a probate. But with a trust, she can't because any claim that she makes or anyone else makes, it's invalid already because the trust is already legal and binding. So this time when she shows up and she's upset, she doesn't have her brothers to leverage because we're the ones settling the estate. So she can't use emotion. She comes up and tells us what's going on. And we say, you know, your parents love you very much. And they set this up the way they thought was best. And if anyone argues, they're going to lose their share. Please don't argue. <laughs> Works like a charm. And then the boys feel bad because they love their sister, you know, and they weren't taking advantage of her or anything. So everybody's getting closer. It really works out well. I still don't see any questions. So here's my question for you. Do you guys trust everyone in your family the same, right? Would you trust them all with your whole estate? I didn't think so. They have access to it, though. I have the in-laws here for a reason. They're usually the ones that trigger a probate. They, don't, they just don't understand what they're doing. They don't have our life experience. And once they've done it, it's too late. And they figure that out a month later, but it's too late. The perfect example, again, that one I brought up is really working. Okay, that young lady, the one with the two boys and the girl, that's exactly what happened here. She was upset and her husband, he's going to save the day. I'll take care of this dear. I'll check into it. Well, you know what he did? He went straight to the courthouse. And then he came back and he goes, you know what they have? You know what you should get? You know what you should do? And they started a probate, just like that. And now everybody's in it and waiting and there's all kinds of animosity and things going on. It's unfortunate. But they didn't know better. I hope these slides are helping. If they're not, please give me a scenario that I am brought up. I'm going to compare some things now, wills and trusts. So maybe I'll bring up what you're talking about. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about trusts. Uh, okay, a will has one position in it. It's called an executor, and it doesn't exist until you passed away. A trust has four positions. The first two are you, and you elect the other two. In the first two positions with you, they exist immediately because the trust is in full force the moment you sign it. All right, 
The first position is called trustor. When you see trustor, think owner. It's very easy. If you're married, you're co-trustors. You're also on the managers. You're the owner and the manager, so you're co-trustors and co-trustees. If it's just you, it's just you. So while you're alive, this trust is alive. You can change anything you want, anytime you want. There's not another living soul on the planet that can do it except you guys. So when you pass away, the trust changes from what's called revocable, meaning you can change it, to something called irrevocable, meaning nobody can change it. And now your wishes must be fulfilled. So you'll choose a new manager, a successor trustee, they'll replace you. As the manager, they can't change anything because they're not the owners, and they're going to give everything to the beneficiaries. And those are the four positions. So if you have one child and you want them to get everything and you want them to give it to your, themselves, then you'll make them 100% beneficiary, and they'll be the successor trustee. If you have five children and you want them to all work together at the same time and you want them all to be successors at the same time, if you're brave, you could do that. Or you can put contingencies, it's this one, if not this one, then this one, or then this one, and this one. So we always have those built in. Same with beneficiaries. Heaven forbid one of your beneficiaries passes away before you, who gets their share? Their children, maybe one child, charities, back to the trust, anyone. It's all up to you. Okay. So that's the major difference between the will and the trust. Now, another major difference is the trust is an ownership vessel. This is the first ongoing service that Safeguard does. We're going to do this forever. We're going to help you fund the trust. Funding the trust is just fancy words for putting your stuff into the trust. That's all. We're going to take your home. John Kazire is licensed by the Supreme Court. He's going to go to the county recorder's office and change the ownership from your house to your trust. So you're, instead of you owning the house, the trust will own the house, and you will own the trust. We're going to work with you on your bank accounts because we don't want your password, so we're just going to assist you. We want to keep it private. And then all this stuff will be owned by your trust, and you will own the trust. It will not change any of your day-to-day -day stuff. It's like a word game. It's a pass-through. It's there, but it's not there unless it's needed. So as far as you're concerned, you don't even know it's there. You do everything normally the way you always did. But if anyone <clears throat> wants to interfere with your wishes, it becomes a roadblock. For instance, um, you want to write a check? Write a check. You want to put money in or out of the bank? Use a credit card? You want to sell your house? Sign your name. The same thing you always do. But again, if someone wants to interfere, it's a roadblock. When you pass away, it's going to give it away for you. Nobody can interfere at all. All right. So I don't see any questions. Let me give you some examples. Um, all right. Let's, let's do the three children again. I'll use those three children, only I'll say they're my children and that I passed away. Okay. I have three children, they passed away, and let's say I've got $3 million. So I want each one of them to split it equally. They all get $1 million. Okay. So when I pass away, let's say one of those children grabs all of that money and decides to keep it. What happens? All right. Well, if I had a will, the child that took all the money did nothing illegal. Nothing illegal, nothing at all. I mean, they violated my wishes, and it's unethical but I'm not here to hold them accountable. And they argue with their brothers and sisters growing up anyway. So this is a lot of money. So let's say what happens if it's a will and they keep it, what happens? Well, let's pretend the other kids have copies of the wills in every account they could possibly need. This is usually how it goes. They'll get attorneys and they'll sue. The child that took the $3 million will also get an attorney. Only they'll ask them, how much do I pay you? So I never have to see the inside of a courtroom and then they'll leave. This attorney will bounce the other two children's attorneys in and out of court till they run out of money or quit. Just like that. They'll never get to talk about it. It's usually how it goes. But with a trust, it's different. See, with a trust, the trust owned it, and the trust didn't give it to them. So when they take it all, they just stole the money, legally stole the money. See the difference? I imagine you can absolutely see the difference. If you're here and, you, and then you say someone can have your money and you pass away and someone else takes it, you're not here to say it's stolen from you. With a trust, the trust is still here and it was stolen. So they got to give it back. There's over 30 pages in a trust. And there's ramifications built in. They actually have to give it all back. The other two kids get one and a half million dollars now. And the child that, uh, that took the money, uh, giving it all back, saying, here, please don't get me in trouble because it's, it's actually real trouble. Um, Yes, David. David, if you want to go 
check us and fill out the form. We'll reach out to you. Thank you. Okay. So let's go over a couple of things then. What if it was a, a trust? Well, if he took all the money with the trust, he stole it. Let's, like I said, has to give it back. That's the major difference. Now, let's try a couple scenarios, hypothetical. Same three kids, same $3 million. If I don't go over something that might suit you, please ask. Let's say one of my kids has uh, credit problems or they have a, 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 an ex spouse waiting for all the money they ever earn or they get in trouble for things that they don't do. It doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm going to tell them all. I'm giving you all a million dollars. You take yours, you take yours, and you, you have an issue. You know, you get in trouble, so keep yours in my trust. If you need it, pull it out and use it. You want to buy a house or a car or have some dinner or something, go ahead and use it. Otherwise, you leave it in my estate. So what happens? I pass away. The child that has those issues leaves it in my estate. And a year later, somebody sues them. Now, they could take it out whenever they want so they can use it. In the meantime, it's there. They could sit down and tell this person suing them they have a million dollars, give them the account number, the address, the phone number, the name of the account, the bank, everything. There's nothing they can do. It's absolutely protected. It's not that child's money until the child takes it. And they haven't. So it's not theirs. They cannot sue my estate for my intentions. It's absolutely protected. And remember, if that child had passed away before me, it would have gone to wherever I wanted uh, as a contingency factor. Well, they kept it in my state. So even though I passed away, if they pass away five years after I do, it's still going to go wherever I said because it's still in my state. In my state, my trust is allowed to survive me for hundreds of years. So I can dole out money in any increment I want over any period of time uh, in any fashion I see fit. Or I can give it away all at once if I want. And I can do it differently for in every individual. It's really amazing. What if I have a child that has a substance abuse problem and they're 60? Well, I know I'm getting older and if I give them the money, it's not good. With a will, I give it to them or I don't. But a trust, I can give one a million, the other one a million, and I can tell this one, you know, I'm going to give you the money. I'm just never going to let you touch it. I'm just going to pay your mortgage and buy your groceries for the rest of your life. Okay, my trust will do it. Or I can give them a check for $5 a week every week for the rest of their life. If I do that and I don't change it while I'm alive, then that's what they get. And remember, they can't argue or they'll lose their share. It's amazing. But you've cut out interference from family members. You've cut out interference from judges, attorneys, and bankers. You've also cut out interference from doctors, nurses, and social workers. And you put you and your family or whoever you choose back in charge. That's what it does. You could say, I want to give my grandkids some of my grandma and grandpa's money. Okay, go to school. You don't go to school, you don't get any grandma and grandma's money. You can do anything you like. All right. So I don't see any questions yet. All right. So this is how we started before, with or without a will. Same thing. With or without a will, but no trust. So now they get a trust. And this is where Safeguard comes in. This is our first ongoing service. We're going to do the funding. Again, John Kazire, licensed by the Supreme Court, will handle your property. But we're going to take everything out of your name and put it into the trust name. So now we have this. You guys own the trust. The trust owns everything else. For you, while you're alive, it's semantics. It's a word game. It doesn't change anything. Now, they live their life. They're good. In this time when the husband passes away uh, and leaves the spouse behind, she's no longer vulnerable. There is no problems on paperwork. Paperwork's not changing. There's no problem whatsoever on the deed. In fact... All of that work that she has to do is already done. The trust owns it. It owns it the day before he passed away, and it just continues to own it the day after. So nothing has changed. Just, she can actually mourn because she can handle this loss now without worrying about her security because as far as her financial affairs go, nothing has changed. It's really tremendous. And then one day, eventually, she'll live her life, and then she'll pass away as well. So they both passed away. Well, the last time there was a question on who owned it, not this time, the trust owns it. It just continues to own it. And your successor trustee or trustees, whoever you choose, they step up to distribute everything according to your wishes. They just call safeguard. And again, we hold their hand and walk them through it. Our average time of settling in a state here in Arizona, if there's only one home and it's located here in Arizona, our average time of settling a state like that is 48 days. We are incredibly fast. Um, it's not our first rodeo. The banks know we're coming and we're trying to ease that burden and we're, we don't want the children to, you know, assist these attorneys with their retirement program at two or $300 an hour. So that's what we're doing. Okay. So I still don't see any questions. 
with a living trust in place, there's no lapse in ownership. With no lapse in ownership, there is no probate. All right, and then the trust, of course, can protect you while you're alive. It has living benefits. Let me explain that a bit. This will help you. When does a will start? When does it take effect? It doesn't start until you pass away. That's when it shows up. And it says, I really want this to happen, but it doesn't have any teeth. It can't enforce itself. And, and there's the issue we're living with today. But a trust, when's a trust take effect? Well, that starts immediately. The moment you sign it, we witness and notarize it, and it's in full force. So it can actually protect you while you're alive. What if some of these things happen? What, what's going to go on if some of these things happen? That's a very important question. When we go to the hospital, you know, they ask their two favorite questions. Of course, the first one is, do you have insurance? <laughs> and the next one is, do you have a living will? First, they want to know if they're getting paid. And second, they want to know if you are, are and your family's in charge or is it the hospital state of Arizona? If you have your own documents, they still try to make you fill out theirs because theirs gives them HIPAA, which is the Privacy Act. You get that with us. You also get the living will. It's a life support document. And there's a medical power attorney they get. But on their documents, they get a release of liability for the hospital, and they know that our documents don't do that. So we give you what's called a complete estate plan. You're going to get HIPAA. Like if you, if you, one of you end up in the hospital and your spouse shows up, you know, where's my husband? He's right there. What happened? Car accident. What's wrong with him? I'm sorry we can't tell you. No HIPAA. You need HIPAA to know what's wrong. You need power of attorney for them to let you make decisions. If you show up, and they got there unconscious, they weren't able to authorize you, and if you don't have documents in advance, you're in the waiting room, you don't get to know anything or make any decisions. Just like that, that's horrible. So you need these documents in advance, or else whoever goes in there, if they can't communicate, they can't authorize them uh, sharing that with you. Imagine you go into the doctor's office and you have these, I have HIPAA and I have power attorney, you're now the boss. Just like that, you're making decisions. There's some of these things I like to call chairs. I compare them to chairs because it's very important we sit somebody in that seat uh, ahead of time. We choose who would be in the chair so that the powers that be can't do it for us. So there's three chairs I like to compare it to. The first one's called a medical power attorney. Uh, it's very important when my wife shows up that she can make decisions for me. I want her to be in charge, not the hospital. And if I don't have it in place ahead of time, well, she wouldn't be. The second one's a financial power of attorney. It's very important. I don't want to get out of the hospital a month later and find out that I have other problems. So I have it set so that if somebody needs to pay my bills, they can. And I won't have other issues when I get out of the hospital. The third chair is the most important chair. What if you're incapacitated? Conservatorship is very important. So if you're incapacitated, it's either somebody appointed by the state of Arizona or somebody you've chosen ahead of time that's in charge of you. There's no two ways about it. I actually have a real life example for you. Some of you might remember Terry Schiavo. Terry was 27 years old. Uh, she had a massive heart attack. It took almost, almost seven full minutes for the first responders to arrive and resuscitate her. So even though she was breathing, there's no brain activity at all. They rushed to the hospital and the moment they got there, the state of Florida was appointed as the conservator. excuse me, what that means is they're in charge. If she had any powers of attorney, they're not honoring those. They're now in charge. They're acting on her behalf. They're paying themselves $1,500 a month from Mr. and Mrs. Shivo's bank account to be in charge. And, um, well, CICU cardio intensive care unit, that was five or 6,000 a day. So we could speculate on the doctor's motives, but Mr. Shivo had to petition the court for legal guardianship so he can stop this. He did, and he won. It took eight years. After eight years, he stopped that outlay of cash, and he pulled that surgically uh, implanted feeding tube out, and three days later, they put the feeding tube back. Her mom, her parents really, but her mom mostly, they took him back to court for seven more years. Uh, he won again, but now she weighed 64 pounds. She was in a fetal position on the news. This was 15 years later. Uh, that was on March 18th. She expired on the 31st. There's only one thing that would have stopped that. That's a living trust. There isn't anything else that would do it. Only a judge establishes conservatorship. Only a trust establishes conservatorship in advance. Even a judge can't do that or argue with it. So imagine if they had had a trust. Mr. Shiva would have automatically been the conservator. 
If not Mr. Shaivo, well, then it would have been their successor or trustee. If not that one, the next one or the next one. You see, the seat is not open. You're now occupying that seat. Worse yet, when Mr. Shaivo wins, he petitions the court for legal guardianship and they give it to him. Well, now he's court supervised. Now he's got to jump through all the hoops. He can't spend any money or do anything for her unless they said, okay. It's insane what he has to go through at this point, but he was just pulling the plug. There's another example I should give you. What about when only one of you's here? One spouse passes, the other one's here. I'll use me. I have a trust. Let's pretend for a moment I don't. My wife's name is Kathy, and I have Shana and Allison are my daughters. So if I don't have a trust, which I do, and I pass away and my wife's here at 75 or 80 and she trips and bumps her head or has a car accident or a stroke or Alzheimer's or something, if they say she can't handle her own affairs, what happens? A local magistrate steps up to have a conservatorship hearing. That's just fancy words for a superior court judge. They like to appoint attorneys. My girls have a conflict of interest. They have to spend their inheritance to take care of their mom. So I like to appoint an attorney. First thing the attorney does is grab all my wife's money, her 401ks, IRAs, bank accounts, and he moves it. There might be fees or stocks attached to those accounts. And if there is, it could go down. The judge is monitoring that and they won't be happy with the attorney. So the attorney just moves the money to something called a guaranteed account. It just simply means it can't go down unless they spend it. There's no fees or stocks attached. Now they can keep my wife in her home or put her in a home. If they keep her in her home, then the attorney has to hire hospice care. They got to monitor that 24 hours a day, monitor my daughter's visits, any friends visits she might have. They're in charge of all the active orders for treatment that my wife has to endure. Or they can throw her into a home and not have to do any of that except the active orders for treatment. Well, of course, you know, they'll do the one with the least amount of work. Well, if they put her in a home, then what do they do with her house? Usually they sell it. They don't want to deal with it. So they'll put that money in that account I just mentioned. They're not stealing the money, they're just putting it where they can use it. But the problem is they just destroyed the whole estate. If my wife passes away and there's anything left over, there's not a single beneficiary or instruction on anything. Every bit of it's up for grabs in probate. If she didn't pass away and she wants it back and thinks she's better, they won't give it back. It was a court order. She'd have to go into open court and try and convince the judge that she can now handle her own affairs. I wouldn't, you know, this, I wouldn't say more often than not, but often enough, the attorney that's about to lose their payday might even be arguing against her. And that's what we're dealing with today. They can't do that to me because I have a trust. If I'm not here and somebody says my wife can't handle her own affairs, my oldest daughter, Shana, is automatically her conservator. If not Shana, it's her sister, Allie. Just like that, they don't have any court liaisons, nothing to jump through hoops. They're going to take care of mom the way they see best. So they're going to keep her in her home. They're not going to throw her in a home. They're going to hire hospice and hold their feet to the dang fire. They're not going to authorize any active orders for treatment they don't think are necessary. It's very simple. And heaven forbid she needed memory care. I can tell you what, she's not going into a state-run facility, that's for sure. They love their mom. That's the difference. You know who loves you. It's either somebody who uh, you've chosen or it's somebody they're going to choose for you. And the stats on this are crazy. The statistics on incapacity are 50%. They're trying to tell us that one out of every two of us are going to be incapacitated at some point in our lifetime. If it happens, it's either somebody you've chosen ahead of time or somebody appointed by the court. That's it. All right. I don't see any questions. Okay. So it happens all the time. This again, right off the, the Maricopa County Superior Court website, but they're all the same and they're talking about that situation I just mentioned. Judges and commissioners assigned to the probate and mental health department oversee over 9,000 active guardianship cases. That's in only this one county. They're controlling all their assets, over $500 million. So they're controlling over half a billion dollars. I don't think they're shy about this. And there's over 3,000 active orders for treatment. This is just one county, and this happens all the time. If it happens and you're prepared, then you know who it's going to be. If you're not, then you don't, and all bets are off. This is what a trust does. It prepares you for the absolute worst possible scenario that can happen while you're alive, and of course, everything and anything in between, and you hope you never need it. But even if you did, it'll handle everything you needed after you were gone just as easy. And it cuts out doctors, nurses, social workers, judges, bankers, and attorneys, and you choose who's there. Now the social services can no longer intervene in your family without being asked. 
Now they must be invited and they can't stay any longer than you wish them there. That's the difference. So the ongoing uh, living benefits that are already established include a healthcare power of attorney, it's already established. Financial power of attorney is already established. Conservatorship is already established. You have authorization of positions, that's the HIPAA, who they can tell what's wrong, and the living will. The life support document, every bit of it's in place ahead of time, and it lasts for out. When you go to the doctor's office, each thing you sign there lasts for that one session. You got to do it again next time. This is from a magazine, a company called Kiplinger, a very famous financial firm here in the United States. They've been here roughly 130 years, so I went with them for credibility. They're talking about the average cost of an attorney like Mark Hall to do a trust like this on the left-hand side there. 2,500 to 3,000, it's about right. You know, I've seen it less, and I've seen it eight or nine times that. Uh, let me back up real quick, tell you why I called Mark a competent attorney, and then I'll move on, I'll tell you what we're doing. Mark's a very good attorney, been here a little over 25 years. Um, he's got over 17,000 clients, more than 17,000 of those clients have trusts. And of all of those clients with trust, not a single one has ever been overturned and gone through probate or been overturned and uh, um, contested, not at once. Um, and so I'm going to give you, hang on, someone's asking a question. I'm going to share a promotion with you right now. What if you live in Washington, seven, eight months of the year in Arizona, balance uh, and own homes in both? No problem at all. No problem at all, John. Just I'm going to give you this little web address you could fill out, and I'll call you up in a few minutes, and I'll answer all your questions directly. If you're interested, of course, let me know. I'll get you started. There's no money out of pocket. All right, and I'll share that with you. Okay. So usually they're in the 2,500 to 3,000 range. I've seen them 10, 15 grand. I've seen them 1,000. I've seen them a lot of things. You get what you pay for them. Our usual fees on this are in the $2,000 range. But today, for all of you, if you're interested, I'd love to help you. No money out of pocket again. Your total cost is $9.95 for a trust. Okay, so that promotion includes the attorney, includes all the documents I just mentioned. So everything that we provide. The one thing it doesn't include is deeds on your home. So right now, you might own properties. If you own properties in Arizona, those are 125 each additional because Arizona wants to be paid to fix it. If you have out-of-state properties, I'll talk to you. If you own a business, that's free of charge. We'll protect that business at no extra charge, and all of its holdings will be automatically protected. So if you have a business that owns 10 homes, you'll be able to protect all 10 of those homes without, a, without an extra fee whatsoever. We don't take a single penny out of your pocket. I just simply put you on the attorney's calendar. You can see them in person in one of our offices, or you can do a phone call or a Zoom or FaceTime, any, any kind of meeting you like. When you're all done with the attorney, if you were not satisfied, you'd say thank you, but no thank you, and you're obligated no further. No money out of pocket, and you're off, and you're not obligated. But if you were happy with the attorney, he's going to ask you six basic questions, who you are, who gets it, who your kids are, things like that. If you're happy with them, you'll pay them $430. Your balance will be $565. You won't pay that until the trust is in your hands and you're satisfied. So the $125 for the deed, if you have one property in Arizona, then that would be at the end as well. That would change $565 into $690. So your total would end up being $1,120 if you want to protect the property as well. Now you could do the property yourself and maybe save $50 and get a quick claim rather than a warranty deed. And I'll check it. But if it's got a mistake, you're going to do it again. It's going to cost you more than you would have spent in the first place. It really has to be perfect. But you get all of this here for the 995. You get the revocable living trust. You get certificates of trust. Okay, that's three pages. It's witness and notarize. That's what we take to the bank. It lets them know you're the trustee and the trustor in your trust. It also tells them who your successor trustee is. What it doesn't tell them is how much money you have, who gets it, when they get it, how many children you have, and so on. It's none of their business. Then the poor will. I mentioned that earlier. It has two basic purposes. Um, first, it's a safety net. We're going to call you once a year around the anniversary of your signing and ask you, how's your health? If your health is okay, then have you made changes? Um, you know, to your assets, bought a house, moved money around. It's very easy. If you didn't protect it, we will. But when you move it around, you just take your name, your trust, and your social security numbers, and you open up an account. It's very simple. If you want to, if you want to, uh, buy a home, you just tell the title company, put the name of the trust on title after you, uh, after you, uh, after the mortgage funds, no problem at all. If they forget, we call you in a year, we do it for you, there's no charge. Anyway, so that's the first thing it does. If It's a safety net. If, if 
you passed away and you've left something out of the trust, this will catch it and pour it over back into the trust. That's why it's called a pour-over will. So it'll allow us to distribute it according to your wishes and get it back in the trust that way. The second thing it does, lists all of your children. So if you have a child that, uh, well, uh, maybe you've given them their, their share earlier. These days, some of them are obnoxious. But if you leave them out and you don't put them back in before you pass away, they're not going to get anything. And they're going to show up. They forgot about me. We're going to say, no, they didn't. <laughs> they just didn't give you anything. See, you didn't leave them anything. There's no babies in the trust. Okay, HIPAA. That's the Privacy Act. Who they're going to tell what's wrong with you if you're in the hospital? Ours is not a little paragraph on some other page. It's a standalone document that says they must tell everybody we're naming by name what's wrong with you. And again, if you're married, you each get a pour over will, you each get all these documents. Or if you're doing a trust with someone else. You also get financial power of attorney. It's very powerful. If you need them to, they can legally collect rent on rentals. They can legally evict people. They can even vote proxies on stocks if you need them to. Our healthcare power of attorney is equally as powerful. Uh, they go show up at the hospital. If you can't communicate, they're the boss, not the doctors or anyone else, whoever you chose is. That living will is a huge document for me. It's a life support document. So if I'm on life support and I'm terminal and my wife's temporarily incapacitated, they're going to call my oldest daughter in. Well, she knows already. Bring HIPAA, bring the medical power of attorney, tell them you have the living will at home. You haven't found it yet. She'll do that and she'll tie their hands. See, the living will says if I'm on life support and I'm on I'm terminal, they can't keep me like that. Well, now they know that I have it. They don't know where it is and she just informed them she's in charge in the meantime. She knows exactly where it is. But now she can go get three or four doctors' opinions and save my life if they're wrong. If they're not wrong, she'll be able to come to grips with that decision. And she doesn't have to make the decision to pull my plug. She's only going to go get this document and turn it in and allow my decision to stand. For me, that's a big deal. My daughter wouldn't do well with that guilt. Um, it's just like the trust I mentioned earlier. If I had a trust and they said my wife was incapacitated and I wasn't here, my oldest daughter, Shane, is automatically her conservator. She's in charge of everything here, too. If not her, it's her sister, Allie. Just like that. Complete funding assistance. We're going to set everything up for you and make sure it's all funded in your trust. Complete settlement assistance for your successors. Well, I know that as well. And that emergency contact card for your wallet is a big deal. Um, we have a credit card machine in the office. It punches out credit cards with no money. There's no magnetic strip. But on the top of it, it says uh, emergency medical card. Then it has your name and your birth date, so you're clearly identified. Um, and let me see here. Gwendolyn, yes. Even with named beneficiaries, it's very vulnerable. Um, fill out this form, and I'll answer all your questions. I'll, I'll help you any way you like. Let me answer them personally so we're not sharing it here. So this emergency contact card has your name and birth date identifying you and says in case of medical emergency, please contact the following. And there's three or four names and numbers in order of your medical powers of attorney. So they call them. An ambulance picks you up. They, they drop you in the hospital and they drop everything in admin. And they look for medication. They glance for a name. They come back five or six hours later. That's the problem. No one knows where you are in the meantime. But with this card, they usually find that in the first 10 or 15 minutes and they call your powers of attorney right away. And they have a chance to get there. It's really huge. All of that's included in the 995. There's no hidden fees, no annual fees, no by the ways, no, no nothing, no surprises whatsoever. You pay once and you're now protected the rest of your life. The only way you'd ever see another fee is if you asked the attorney engaged him in additional services. So let's say you wanted to change the trust. You can change homes and bank accounts all the time, doesn't affect the trust. But if you want to change language, like, I have three kids, I want them to split it equally. Well, now I want one of them to get the house, and then they can split the rest. Or maybe I want to add 50 people. Anything like that's a beneficiary change. When you change a trust, it's called an amendment because it's already legal and binding. A will is just a codicil. So the trust, you need an attorney. Our attorney is not making his living there. It's very insignificant. So the last seven and a half years I've worked with our attorney, if you had a beneficiary change, his cost on that has been a little less than $200. It's insignificant. If you want to change your successor trustee, you need to be able to do it. It's something that's very rare. But maybe someone became an alcoholic or something, and you need to get them out of that position. Okay. You're going to change trust certificates of trust, pour over wills. You're changing everything in that trust. You're still only looking in the neighborhood of 400 bucks. If you don't do anything like that, you're never going to see another fee from us again. And it's not from us. That's from the attorney. And only if you ask. 
So this trust will now protect you the rest of your life. You'll never see another fee whatsoever. We have tremendous reviews. I hope you looked them up while I was talking there. And uh, this one, of course, says, I feel relief now. Uh, we're A-plus rated at the Better Business Bureau. We have reviews at the BBB as well. This one talks about the initial interaction and how they were pleased with our experience. Derek's one of the funding managers in, in Tucson Oro Valley. Jeff Sykes, my friend, my associate, we do this together. Mark Hall is the attorney. Julie Jewett is our office manager. She's actually born in Arizona. Tom Perzak and John Owner are the owners of Safeguard. If you decide to go through this process and you want to say something online, please ask us for a link. Julie will give you a link. Say anything you like. It's never a good time to procrastinate. I'm so grateful you spent this time with me. I hope it was beneficial. I'd love to hear from you, answer all your questions. Of course, if you're interested, let me know and I'll help you. Um, what you do, it's never a good time to procrastinate. I know that because they put that there for me. <laughs> if you uh, want to type in this line on the bottom of that line right there, you type that into your browser. You can't enter it, you like copy and paste it because it's a PowerPoint. So you got to write it down. I'll leave it up for a minute. And then you'll type it into your browser. Safeguard your estate is one word. Safeguardyourestate.com forward slash form. You hit the enter button and it'll bring up our form. Give me your name and number and hit submit and I'll call everybody in the next little while and answer everybody's questions. And anyone who's interested, please let me know. I'd love to help you. Again, not a single penny out of pocket to get started. Safeguard your estate. It's S A F. E-G-U-A-R-D-Y-O-U-R-E-S-T-A-T-E dot com forward slash form. Type all that into your browser. I'll be able to see what's going on for you, and I can go ahead and answer all your questions. If you're interested, I'd love to help you. I cannot thank you enough. Let me see real quick here on questions. Where'd they go? Here they are. Okay. Yes, yes, Gail. Uh, Nine ninety-five is for both of you in the same trust, of course, unless you want a different trust for some reason. But one trust will do you both very easily. Gwendolyn, um, I'll answer those questions, of course. Why? And when you fill the form, just a second. Um, John, uh, yes, it doesn't change anything as far as uh, your credit scores, your mortgages, or anything. Uh, it's not going to interfere with anything you do tax-wise. It's not going to take away any advantages. It's not going to create any disadvantages. There is a big tax advantage. If Sometimes we put our children's names on our house. Okay, if you put them on the house in the bank accounts and they get in an accident or get sued for some reason, they could take your house because they own it too. If that doesn't happen, they'll get the house, but the problem is you've exposed them to capital gains taxes. They're a secondary owner. They don't get to move it around. So let's say they weren't sued, they passed away, and they get the house. You passed away, they get the house because their name's on it. And it's worth $350,000 more than it was when you bought it. Well, in today's dollars, they would owe the IRS a little over $86,000, and they want their money. But if you give it to them as a beneficiary through the trust, they can get in all the trouble you want. It only affects you because you love them and want to help them. It doesn't affect your estate. And when you pass away, they'll get the house. No taxes at all. They'll get it for every dollar it's worth, a full evaluation. If you paid a dollar and it's worth 10 million, they'll get every penny. Great question, John. I hope to hear from you in a second. Thank you. And of course, David, I'll, I'll look it up and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, I won't be able to call you right now because I don't have your number, um, but I will get it from Julie, our office manager, or if you fill out the form and I'll reach out to you in a bit. Thanks, David. You guys are great. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.